Can everybody hear me? All right. Uh, so first of all, let me uh, thank you uh, for being here today. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to present some of our work at the Global Platform 2019, especially given that the Global Assessment Report 2015 is what got me into GIS mapping after seeing some very cool uh, risk maps. So before I start, my name is Jeremy Vetterwald and I'm the country coordinator of Impact in Ukraine. And the work that I will be sharing with you today um, is really on using network mapping analysis in crisis context and it was funded by USAID since 2017. Before I start, this, this research was developed with my team and I want to make special mention to my GIS colleague Yaroslav Smirnov who's done a lot of the analysis behind this. Um, so for those of us that don't know us, REACH is an initiative of IMPACT, uh, ACTED, and UNOSAT, and we support assessment, information management, and mapping in more than 20 uh, crisis-affected countries. You might have noticed that uh, the map behind me is actually represents Geneva, in which, sorry, you are here, right? And what I quite enjoy about these black and white maps is that they quite elegantly show how human societies have decided to organize their living environment. And so, you might have guessed it, but the thing I want to talk to you about today are cities. And more specifically, cities as systems. Does anybody around here recognize that city on the, on the slide here by any chance? London. Exactly, London. And so what I find super fascinating about this is that by only showing you main communication channels such as roads or rivers, you're able to pretty much identify a city due to how they have organically grown over time. And the reason cities grow in these quite distinct patterns is due to the fact that they tend to develop around key natural resources such as waterways and other geographical features such as mountains or hills. And so, when I was studying in London, I watched this fascinating documentary on fungi. In my defense, it was a very cold, rainy Sunday, and that sounded like the best thing to do with a cup of tea. But what was really interesting is that researchers had found that a specific type of fungi was able to build the most effective network to its food sources, so the yellow going towards these, uh, these white spots, by minimizing the amount of energy it needed to use to gather these resources. And what was very interesting is that the network that the fungi developed was exactly, it was exactly the same as the one that the Tokyo network, railway network system had organically been into. And so, very much like the fungi, <laughs> uh, cities connect uh, people and resources in what we think is the most effective way. And of course, you find these networks beyond traditional administrative boundaries. And so, for example, I found this very interesting map from, from researchers at EPFL uh, that really showed that cities like Geneva, Lausanne, Zurich attracted commuters from beyond their boundaries. And this is very much what the OSC, OECD calls functional urban areas. And so, if you were to translate these, these networks into polygons, well, it looks something, Switzerland would look something like that, right? In a sense, you have the city cores, which are where most of the activity is concentrated, but then you have the commuting zone in this light uh, purple pattern. And what's super interesting is that if you look at the uh, planning assumptions of Le Grand Genève, which is an urban development program around Geneva, you really see how urban planners are now adapting this thinking in their planning. And so in normal times, of course, these networks operate in a somewhat functional manner. So what happens to these networks when a crisis occurs? And so today I'm going to talk to you about city systems in crisis. And the map that you see around here, and I'm using conflict as, as an example, but you can pretty much apply that to any type of, of crisis, is the city of Donetsk and Makivka in eastern Ukraine. And since 2014, uh, the, the, the eastern regions of Donetsk and Lugansk have been affected by conflict opposing the Ukrainian army and separatist forces. And what this gift shows is basically how the geography of that conflict has evolved. 
But what's very interesting about the Ukrainian context is that this line of contact, this physical separation, is cutting through one of the most densely populated regions of the country. And what you see is that these large urban centers, which are based on the, on the Europe, Joint European Research Center Global Humanitarian uh, Human Settlement data set, the major urban centers are now in non-government controlled areas, and the urban peripheries are in government controlled areas. And these don't really interact. And so here you see kind of a very interesting geography that developed in the Ukraine context in which you have these government controlled areas in green and these non-government controlled areas in orange. And so it's important to highlight that people can still move between the two geographies, but it takes them an average around four hours. And here, <laughs> for some of you that might be commuting into Geneva, Think of what would happen uh, if the next day you had to wait four hours to cross the border from France to Geneva. How would that impact uh, your access to work, your access to healthcare, or your next travel plans leaving from Geneva Airport? So back in 2017, we tried to map the impact of the crisis on where people access services. And what was fascinating is that when we asked people living in the urban peripheries of these urban centers that are now not accessible, they totally organically reoriented towards government control area. And what we were able to do is that using cluster analysis, we developed a bit this concept of basic service units, which says what would be the most relevant administrative unit for planning a response to these people. And so the, the thinking is quite straightforward, right? In crisis, due to population movement, loss of physical connectivity, the demand for goods and services and ability to supply them changes quite drastically. And these changes in basic service units are super interesting to investigate. So that's what we did, basically. Uh, so the big question was, how do we some somehow uh, quantify these dynamics? And so what we came up is, of course, not a solution, but an interesting area of investigation. So in 2018, we started, a map, we started to zoom in in one of these administrative areas in the periphery of the largest city in Donetsk. And what we saw was that all of the people before the conflict were accessing tertiary healthcare services in Donetsk city. And so that means there was about 20 settlements that, went, that were dependent on Donetsk to access their services. But then, when we asked, where do you go now to access your services? You see that only four persons, or four settlements, people from four settlements, were able to access services in Donetsk city. And, and what's really, what's super interesting is that by putting these two maps together, you're able to map these dynamic changes in, in basic service units. And you saw that kind of, before the main hub was Donetsk, but now most people go to the small town of Kurahove. And to give you a sense of scale, this town is about 20, is, is, has a population of 23,000 people. And so one can only wonder, how, how are the health facilities in this city of 23,000 people coping with that extra demand and with that new reality? But we did not stop at healthcare only, we looked at, of course, employment markets. And so, very, like, very, in, very similar dynamics as with the healthcare systems, we saw that about 23 settlements were depending on this large urban center for employment. Can anybody guess how much it was back in two, uh, now in 2018? Well, the answer is zero. Nobody now commutes to Donetsk to work. What are the consequences of that on your employment, on your household economic security? Um, and, and all of these dynamics have major implications on every aspect of development, including planning, job creation, education, healthcare, governance, financial services. And so to try and quantify a bit that impact on service delivery, uh, we looked, we, we, we tried to evaluate what was this change of catchment area in terms of overall population. I'll give you the example. What we were able to do is basically using different methods of population estimation, we estimated that there was about 98,000 people that were dependent on Donetsk city for accessing their healthcare services. 
based on the new network analysis, we found that this, this population within that catchment area was about 886,000. So on one hand, you're seeing a decrease of about 10% in the overall potential caseload of the city of Donetsk. Now, um, sorry. And on the other hand, the population in the city of Kurahove, this new hub that had developed, pre-conflict, we estimated that there was about 40,000 people living in the catchment area of the healthcare facilities in Kurahove city. But now, in 2018, that population rose to 47,000 people. And that's an increase of 17%. So, of course, there are many limitations to what we have done. Huh? A, lot of the population date, a lot of the population data relied on pre-conflict population data. We looked at settlements very much as one unit. So that means that if one of the members of the population was going to that specific settlement, we incorporated all the settlements within our calculations. Um, and also, it requires a lot of data. Huh? So we did household surveys and key informant interviews. So it's quite logistically and data, from a data collection point of view, it's actually quite heavy. So what we're trying to do now is looking at optimization process or looking at ways we can try and, con and define these commuting patterns using different ways of, of, uh, of analysis. But on the relevance of this type of approach, is that really it identifies the most relevant geography based on service delivery and not administrative units. And it really provides a tool to understand the cascading consequences of disasters of our crisis. Because the way we think of disasters very much is this town is affected, hence the population from this town are in crisis. But the reality is that the repercussions are way larger than the actual affected area. And what it hopefully does is that it would eventually, by understanding where people are organically accessing services, it would strengthen the ability of aid planners to support local level capacities. And finally, I think it was one of the key messages from the, from the GAR 2019 launch, the importance of not thinking in silos, right? And this approach, which, is, uh, which looks at, at geography as a primary unit of analysis, enable, promotes kind of multi-sectoral area-based uh, approaches. So basically, um, basically, that's it for, for now. I think we still have a few minutes for, for question and answers. But anyway, very, thank you very much for, for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. I, it's, it's OK. I, I can hear you all. I just need more clarification. Yes. How do you consider settlement as a unit when you have different characteristics within the city in yeah. terms of employment, in terms of labor, in terms of so many other things? How do you just clarification I need? I no, thanks. To, and it, it's an excellent question because I've worked in many different contexts, whether it was Madagascar, Bangladesh, Cameroon or Ukraine. But the, the lucky thing in Ukraine as a kind of post-Soviet state has very well established structures of governance. So the way we defined the settlement to start was based on administrative boundary. One settlement being one actual unit uh, with, an ad with some administrative relevance. But what we're trying to promote with the approach is to look beyond these administrative boundaries to create a basic understanding of service access networks to support local level planning. So we're basically trying to shift the approach from an administrative level of understanding to a very organic settlements based approach of understanding. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>